So it's not a volume issue, it's just me. Okay, today, today our speaker will be Seth Applegate. He is a research agronomist for the Iowa State University Monarch Research Team. Seth is researching the best management practices for establishing high diversity native habitat, aka prairies, to benefit monarch butterflies, pollinators, and other wildlife. The, the ISU Monarch Research Team is working to conserve the eastern monarch butterfly population in Iowa and the Midwest. Seth grew up on a diversified corn, soybean, swine family farm in central Iowa. He graduated from ISU in 2016 with an MS in crop production and physiology. His graduate research program examined cover crops and cover crop mixes. So, pass off to Seth. So yeah, my background is more in row crop production and cover crops and stuff like that. Um, so just a disclaimer at the start that I'm, I'm not a, I don't come from a hardcore conservation background, but I do like it and it's been a fun job so far. So uh, yeah, my title, uh, research agronomist, I don't really know what to call myself. I'm trying to figure out how we produce prairies most efficiently, effectively, low cost. And so I went with uh, research agronomist because that's, that's what I know. Um, there's my email if any of you want to ask me questions afterward. Um, and we're going to go through pollinator monarch habitat establishment, but this will also apply to basically any kind of native plants that you're going to be planting out there in some kind of grassland-like planting, but it will focus on the pollinator style plantings. And then I should also say that when I say monarch habitat, I'm basically saying a pollinator planting that has a lot of milkweed in it, or at least a decent amount of milkweed. There's some modifications you might make to a seed mix, but not a lot other than adding in milkweed. So if you already have a pollinator planting, throw in some milkweed and you'll help out the monarchs as well. So we're going to kick off this talk, me convincing all of you who really don't give a rip about monarchs because I know there are all kinds of people like that. Now, I would admit that that's a rather sad lifestyle if you don't like, you know, butterflies and cute orange things. Um, it's, it's, it's a bummer, but, you know, there's those people out there. So for those of you who are like, I don't, I don't really care about monarchs and I'm not sure we're spending all this money on them, well, we're also going to be benefiting pollinators, which I already alluded to. And this group understands that because you're a little more conservation bent than my usual group of uh, presenting to row crop farmers. But maybe you're like, I don't really like insects and butterflies. That's just not my thing, Seth. That, I need another reason to care about this. Or do you care about Uckland game birds or other grassland-dependent birds? This kind of habitat that we establish for pollinators will be really beneficial for upland birds. And so there's another way you could care about monarchs, even though you don't care about monarchs. But maybe you're like, I don't really like insects, and I don't really like animals. So that probably doesn't fit anyone in this crowd. But, uh, you know, maybe there's somebody here. Uh, maybe you have some corn, soybean fields that, you know, it's just not producing. And if you were honest, year after year, this area just stinks. It's in a wet hole, and you know it. And so you're going to do something about that. So we can do um, precision conservation. We look at our soil maps, and we look at our yield maps, and we say, this just isn't producing year after year. And you can convert that into pollinator habitat. So there's an economic incentive. Now, let's talk about mowing. We're here in the mid Midwest where we love to mow. Right? And we just mow all the time. I grew up on a farm mowing all kinds of things that didn't need to be mowed because that's what we do. Short grass is awesome. Let's mow. Uh, stop doing this, people. It doesn't make sense. I know that for some of you it would be super hard to stop mowing. But you could save a lot of money if you turn this into something diverse and just let... Um, let it be some native habitat, and after five years or so, there's, there's way less management than burning through a bunch of gas and spending all that time bouncing around on a mower or paying your teenager to do that. Find some other job for them to do. Uh, and then, you know, maybe you, you're going to keep mowing. You know, I can't convince you on that. You're going to keep farming those wet holes, and you don't really like wildlife. Okay. Well, do you like pretty things at all? Uh, pollinator habitat, monarch habitat is just really attractive. And you might, some of you might be like, I'm not going to do things just because it looks nice, Seth. You know, you think I'm like really rich or something. I bet most of you have some kind of landscaping around your house. And that doesn't exactly return money. Or you mow your grass around your house to make it look nice. That's not returning money. For some people, planting these kind of habitat, um, plantings, it's just something they can enjoy and walk around and appreciate. So that's, 
One of my last things, but if none of these things work for you, you don't like pretty things, you don't like monarchs, you don't like pollinators because you don't like to eat food, um, you like to mow and you're gonna keep farming those wet holes, my last and saddest motivation for you to care is that somebody else does care. And so we may have problems like the government or regulations coming in or environmental groups pressing lawsuits. If we don't do voluntary things to conserve monarchs and pollinators and other species that depend on native habitat. So that's the saddest thing I can motivate you with. Now let's all step back into fifth grade or whenever your science program was that covered the introduction to the monarch butterfly. All right, the monarch life cycle, for those of you not familiar. We start off with an egg, and this egg is very small. And when you first start your job working for the monarch research team, you're not sure whether it's an egg or just some little white speck. It's smaller than the head of a pin. And so you'll have that egg, and you go through these multiple stages. This is the one you guys are all familiar with, right? It's called a fifth instar. But there's all these little guys that take time to move to this size. And then we have the chrysalis. Everyone knows, very hungry caterpillar kind of idea. And then we move to a full-size monarch by the time we get to about a month. And that's dependent on temperature. So that's the monarch life cycle for a single monarch. Let's get this straight. There are male and female monarchs. The males have the dots, the females do not. All right, now let's get this straight. There are monarchs and there are not monarchs. This is a monarch. It's got this nice swoop right here. That's the identifying characteristic. This is a viceroy. It's a poser, it's a fake. This line right here tells you this is not a real monarch. Just want to get that straight. Sometimes you get pictures from people who are like, I found a monarch, and it's a bunch of viceroys. And it's like, well, I'm sorry to break it to you. It's not a monarch. OK, let's talk about milkweed now and the need for milkweed and nectar plants. So I think most of you are familiar that the monarch butterfly absolutely needs milkweed to complete its life cycle. So the adult butterflies will only lay their eggs on milkweed, and then the larvae will only feed on milkweed. But maybe what you didn't realize is that the adults need nectar. And so people are always talking about milkweed, and it is important. We have a lot of milkweed loss, but we also need nectar plants. We've lost a lot of our prairies in Iowa and throughout the Midwest, and we need to provide for nectar, uh, the nectar needs. You also may not know that uh, there's a bunch of varieties, um, sorry, not varieties, species of milkweed that we have in the Midwest. And at least in Iowa, there's 17 species that are native. You're probably most familiar with common milkweed, which is the one that grows in ditches everywhere in Iowa, and I believe most of everywhere in the US, uh, sorry, in the Midwest. Um, but we have 17 that are native. I should also say that I'm gonna present from a really Iowa-centric viewpoint, because I've lived there my whole life, and so for you people in Illinois and Wisconsin, I just apologize right now, and uh, I'll do what I can to, to help you out. Okay, now the monarch life cycle in terms of a, the bigger picture and the migration, this is what makes the monarch so uh, amazing. And if, if this is confusing, you're like, I don't really understand what's going on, you won't remember this, I would encourage all of you to hop onto Netflix, or you could just buy it off Amazon. There's a, a kind of a documentary movie called Flight of the Butterflies. And that's a great one to just show you this is what the monarch life cycle is like and where it was found and the, uh, finding the overwintering habitats and that kind of stuff. It's a really cool movie. So the monarchs will spend their summers up here in the Corn Belt region and up into Canada and then they will fly this huge distance all the way down to just outside of Mexico City. They'll overwinter in the evergreen forests there, and they'll all congregate on a really tight space. They don't spread way out. And I am also should say I'm talking about the population east of the Rockies, not west. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the ones west of the Rockies really at all today. And so they'll overwinter in, uh, just outside of Mexico City, and then the first generation will move up into Texas. And then the second generation third generation will move up into this area, and this is the summer breeding range. And why do I have a red square around that area? It's because that area is so important. We have 90% of overwintering monarchs originate from that red area. So Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, all of these states are very important for monarch uh, conservation. And you'll also realize that this is where we grow a lot of our corn and soybeans, 
and where we've lost a lot of our prairies. This is the population decline that's been observed for approximately the last 25 years. We don't have numbers from before this, so if you ask a question about that, the answer is we just don't know. Uh, so this is the amount of hectares. Uh, hectare acres equals about 2.5 acres that the monarchs take up when they overwinter in Mexico. That's how we measure it. They're, they literally do some, some math stuff and, and figure out how large is the area. And so we can see that there's a pretty clear downward trend to this graph. It doesn't take a statistician to figure that one out. Uh, the numbers here, we're at 2.5 hectares. So that is our number for this, this year, and that just came out uh, this week. This came out this week. And the levels that they say are sustainable for monarch population is 6 hectares. So this line right here, which we haven't been at in the last 10 years, this would be the population level where we say it's stable, things are okay. If we had uh, something weird happen, we'd probably be all right. And you may ask, okay, what's the reason for this decline? And a, a definite reason that we do know is loss of habitat and loss of milkweeds. That's not hard to know. But that is not the only factor. People get the idea that it's just about milkweed, but we also had there's logging issues in Mexico, destroying some of the forest. We have climate change that could be affecting them. We have different, um, there's a lot of different things going on in the environment, and there are a lot of interactions, and this is relatively hotly debated at different points. But we know that habitat is one of the things. You know, if, if they don't have a home, they're, they're not going to grow. If they don't have something to reproduce on, we know we won't have them. So that's one of the areas that I really work on addressing. So now that I talked about, you know, what is good habitat for a second for the monarch, let's just think in general, if we're going to plant this kind of habitat or a diverse native planting, what, what makes good habitat? And how can we not just meet the needs of the monarchs? Because we have, although the monarch is awesome, it's kind of this flagship species, you know, everyone cares about it. And that's so good. But we want to meet all these other needs at the same time. So meeting the needs of pollinators, meeting the needs of uh, something like rusty patched bumblebee and some others is really important. So what is good habitat? Basically, to make it simple, uh, it's a good home with good food, just like you would refer to it as. So how can we provide a good home with good food to a lot of different species, including pollinators and monarchs? Something like the rusty patch bumblebee, for those of you not familiar, this is an endangered species now. And to my understanding, it's the only endangered bee we have in the U.S. Has seen a serious decline in the last five years. Uh, how can we meet the needs for deer and upland game birds and other birds? How can we combine this to make good habitat? And what kind of habitat do we have in Iowa? And it's probably going to be mostly representative when I say Iowa of the Midwest. So just bear with me on that. So in Iowa, this is what we have a lot of, right? We have our corn or soybeans on this side. And throughout, you know, all these buffers and strips and stuff, we have things like smooth brome grass or whatever your cool season grass is in your area. It's not native. It grows really well. It does an awesome job of preventing nitrogen loss from the fields and nutrient loss and holds the soil in place. So that's awesome. That's really good. But what it doesn't provide is habitat. This grass is really thick. It's really difficult for wildlife to move through this. And do you see any nectar sources here providing for pollinators? No. No, you don't. And do you see any milkweed? No. Sometimes there is. Sometimes there is in this kind of environment. But that's about the only thing that we could be providing. So at this site, it's really just bad cover and limited food. And this grass just lays over flat in the winter, not providing cover during that whole season. So maybe then thick native grass is the ideal habitat, but that's not true as well. Thick native grass is definitely better than our cool season grasses in terms of providing habitat, but it's part of the picture, not the whole picture. And basically this provides okay cover, so you'll see that there are gaps here in these grasses. So that they're, they're, they're bunch grasses instead of sod forming grasses. And so wildlife can move through that. And that's awesome. But this is still really thick. And if it's not managed, it'll be very difficult for wildlife to move through this. And once again, limited food because we don't have forbs, pollinators um, in this kind of environment. And it's generally not going to encourage a lot of milkweed growth for monarchs. So our answer is diverse habitat is ideal. This is going to provide good cover and lots of food. 
So with all these kind of wildflowers out here, we're going to be meeting the needs of pollinators and monarchs. And the seeds that are produced by this kind of a diverse planting will feed lots of different wildlife, um, different kinds of birds, and will also bring in just more insects, which is really important for the grassland-dependent birds. Uh, there are much higher rates of pheasant and quail uh, adults, so the chicks making it to adulthood when they're grown in something that's a diverse habitat like this than it is where you have a less diverse habitat. So that's another way that even, you know, if you're not so sold on the pollinator idea, if you care about upland birds or upland game birds, this is another way to help that out. Okay, so I talked kind of theory on the front end and kind of introduced the monarch, and now I'm just going to step into practicalities talking about habitat establishment itself. It's going to be kind of how-tos and, and, and stuff like that. All right, so let's identify a good spot. You're like, all right, Seth, you did a great job. You convinced me to care about monarchs. Now I can go find a spot. Let's talk about your spot. So one of your first things to think about is your risk of spray or drift. If you're the one who's applying the herbicides right next to the field, you'll probably be good because you'll pay attention to the wind direction and you'll make sure you don't spray off and kill your prairie. But if you have someone like, you know, I don't, I don't know who, um, somebody that sprays on a lot of windy days, you may want to put your plot just a little further away from that field. I have seen plots right up against next to fields and they're mostly fine, but that's, those were fields sprayed by the landowner. So it's possible. Um, then we got erosion potential. If you have a really steep spot, you may just want to add in more grasses and not worry about packing it full of forbs, but having a half-half mix of grasses and forbs will be enough to prevent serious erosion. Think about site maintenance. So you have to get to these sites to mow them and maintain them. You can't just walk away from them and be like, good job, Prairie, you got this. I'll come back on and check on you later. No, you got to go to that site often to mow it and maintain it. So choose a site that's close to your house or wherever your equipment is if you can. Site longevity, you don't want a site that you're going to convert to corn, soybeans, or some kind of building. So think about that. As well as sunlight, I get questions sometimes about, I have a partially shaded area, can I grow it there? Not really. There are lots of species that are adapted to your woodland environments. Those spring ephemerals do a great job of providing a lot of um, pollinator benefit for the bees in the early part of the season. But the prairie is, is in an open area and it's in the sun. And these species are adapted to that environment. Probably the most important thing to think about is your existing vegetation. So at any site that you have, you have all kinds of different existing vegetation you have. Uh, one of the most common in Iowa is going to be brome grass. Okay, it's work, but it's doable. Do you have reed canary? Forget it. I basically say, don't try with that site. You're going to spend so much money and years on chemicals that it won't be worth it. Unless you really want to, and you're in it for the long haul, then we'll go after it and get it. Um, if you have something like Canada thistle, just pick a different site if possible. But I will say, with all of these considerations that I've made, you might go, wow, I... I don't fit any of those, or I don't have an ideal location. And my advice is that more habitat always equals a better result than less. So even if you don't have an ideal place, I go ahead and do it anyway, because we need more habitat, and you don't have to have an ideal place to establish a prairie. OK, let's talk about seed for a little bit now. Seed mixes people get really excited about, so we'll spend some time on that. Let's talk about some general guidelines. I'm going to put up this list, and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, that's so many things. How am I supposed to remember this? And this is relatively overwhelming. You're right, it is. I did that on purpose to tell you that you should talk to NRCS or a DNR private lands biologist or someone from Pheasants Forever to really help you think through seed mixes. It's a complex world to understand seed mixes and to understand what goes into them and to not um, plant something that's garbage. It takes a lot of time. And so those people should know how to review a seed mix and tell you, this is good. This is a good one. Or, no, this is terrible. You should not plant this. So some of the general things, I'm still going to go through this list, though, with you. For those of you who are seed mix gurus and geeks and, and like to think about this stuff, I would, I would encourage you to buy Iowa native species, so things that are native to this, I mean, I say Iowa, I'm saying things adapted to your state, okay? I'm just going to keep saying Iowa, though, because uh, that's what I do. I'm from Iowa. 
So buy species that are adapted to your state and are native to your state and were grown in your state. You might be surprised sometimes if you just bought a seed mix, didn't ask the seed dealer about it, that you'll end up with seeds from Oregon, from Pennsylvania, from Texas. They're just doing whatever they can to either provide the seed because they're already out of it or their crop failed this year, or uh, they're trying to save a buck and the seed from Texas is really cheap. They may not have sinister motives, they may just not have the seed, but asking them ahead of time so you know what you're getting is really important. So those are the two major things I would really want you to focus on when you talk to a seed dealer if you're going to actually go pick one yourself with a seed dealer. In terms of planting a pollinator mix, you really want to limit the amount of those tall competitive grasses such as Indian grass, big blue stem, switchgrass. These grasses are great native grasses, but they're very tall, they're very competitive, and they can take over an environment relatively quickly. Often in a pollinator uh, setting, you're battling the grasses taking over. It's just that later successional phase. You always start off with some forbs. You know, it's kind of the early succession stage, and then as time moves along, it turns into grasses if you don't manage it. And so starting with less grasses to start is a really good way to help manage that. And it's, it's just difficult when they become established generally more quickly than the grasses. You can get seed mixes that are soil moisture specific, so seed mixes that are for wet soils or dry soils. You also want something that's going to flower April through October. You don't want to have big gaps in the season where there's no provisions for pollinators. Generally, a pollinator mix is 75% forbs, 25% grass. You want to have 35 species or more, two or more milkweed species, and no single forb greater than 10% of the mix. And you may ask, basically what I'm telling you here is diversity, plant high diversity. And why is that so important? Um, if you've walked through a prairie and you've seen it change with the landscape, um, it's amazing to watch a site that has one seed mix planted and you'll suddenly move from tall grasses, then to a forb area, then to these wetter species, all within maybe 100 meters, and it looks like the elevation isn't changing. But all you had to do was plant one seed mix, and then the seeds figure out where they grow. And then in any year, you have some um, of the flowers that are doing really well, and maybe others that are doing poor, and then maybe the other, you know, the next year it goes the other way around. But you're always providing by putting out a lot of diversity. So that's a, a major point is more diversity is always better. And once again, talk to your conservation person who knows more about this so they can walk you through it. Because there's just a lot of steps in looking at a seed mix. Now I'm going to harp on something that's a, a little bit of a soapbox for you. So I'm just going to step over here and stay on my soapbox for a little bit. Um, and ask you, is your seed mix actually high diversity? And this relates to specific species in your seed mix. So you could have 100 species out there, but do you really have 100 species? And what I'm saying is seed rates are generally, um, they should be the, the, the more current and common and up-to-date uh, way of presenting seed mixes is by how many seeds you're planting per square foot not by the weight, that's the old way of doing it, but seeds per square foot is, is way better and it's the standard that NRCS uses now. So if you have, and you're looking through the seed mix, generally in a seed mix that's approved by NRCS and then most people just kind of follow that standard, you're planting 40 seeds per square foot. All right, that's the standard. Now if you look at your seed mix and you see that there's a seed, that's a species that's in there, maybe it's a really important one, like um, lead plant or something like that, or um, purple prairie clover, something like that, really great pollinator species, and they're in there at a really low rate, you know, 0 0.01 seeds per square foot. That makes up like 0.25% of the mix. Okay, what will that turn into in the long term? So if we say 5% survival, you're going to have this turn into about 22 plants per acre. And 5% survival for most prairie species is a little bit optimistic. Not too optimistic, but a little bit in some situations. It can be 5 to 10%. It all depends on how well you prepare your site and stuff. So that's, that's not terrible. You still have 22 plants of whatever out there. That, that's good. But then when you start getting down to seed, um, 
seed rates of like 0 0.005 seeds per square foot. You have to start asking, is this doing any good? I'm only going to have 11 plants of that one particular species out there. So basically, I'm walking you through this because what I'm concerned of is that your seed mix dude who you maybe, you know, you don't have a, you don't know what to think of the guy other than he sells seed mixes. He probably knows what he's doing. But if he hands you a seed mix and he's got, I don't know, 35 species, but like 10 of them are in at this rate, you don't actually have diversity in that seed mix. Does that make sense? It's in at such a low rate that it's almost not going to show up. And most people will just take a seed mix, read through it, and go, oh, man, that's awesome. It has my 15 favorite native species in it. Probably most of you don't do that. That's just me when I read seed mixes. Um, but you, you then have to look over to the right and figure out what is the rate. Is it actually in the seed mix or not? OK, I step off my soapbox now and get off of that one. Um, so our timing for seed purchase, generally buying earlier in the calendar year, is going to make things cheaper. When you're thinking about selecting a dealer, obviously price is important and seed species availability. And once again, to say the same point, get your seed from Iowa, grown in Iowa, native to Iowa. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about seed mixes and what they'll actually look like when you're out there in the field and what are the differences. So like I already said, generally seed mixes are 40 seeds per square foot. And the thing that differentiates a lot of the major seed mixes is your ratio of grass to forbs. And so sometimes people will just throw out these numbers like, yeah, it's a 1030 mix. And they might say, I don't know what that means. They're saying there's 10 grass seeds per square foot and there's 30 forb seeds per square foot in any given planting. So under the programs that we have in CRP, if you're in the CP42 pollinator program, this requires a 1030 mix, so that's 75% Forbes. If you're in some of the other programs, or even if you're outside of these programs, the, the, the concept still applies. Now, like CP25, 33, or 38, you're allowed to do a 1030 mix, a 2020 mix, so that's half and half, or 3010. This may depend on your state and your um, county DC with NRCS. Uh, they will have a lot of discretion over this, but you, you have a lot more flexibility. And so uh, what you'll find if you're in one of these practices or you're just thinking about doing this yourself is that these seed mixes are cheap. They're really cheap because it's grass. You're buying a lot of grass. And like I've already said, the grass tends to dominate, so we try to limit that. And now I'm going to show you visually what this looks like when we end at year three plantings. Okay. So this is a 1030 mix. This is a pollinator mix. And the picture is not awesome because I took it in October. Uh, sorry, October, end of August. And so most of these things have senesced. But you can see that there's a lot of these black seed heads all over the place in here. And so we have a lot of forbs that have already senesced. Whereas the grasses, you can see uh, kind of wispy lines here. That's mostly our grasses. So you can see there's a lot of, a lot of forbs in this 1030 mix. When you move to a 2020, you can see there's a lot more grass. This is a lot of Canada wild rye showing up here. And you just get a lot more, um, a lot more grass in this kind of setting. Then when you move to a 3010 mix, lots of grass, right? Now you have 75% grass in this kind of a stand. Okay, now these pictures that I have are from Tallgrass Prairie Center at University of Northern Iowa. So here's one you can see, wow, I mean, that is just, there's a lot of Forbes in that picture. When you have a 1030 mix, we move to a 2020, quite a bit more grass. And then a 3010, more grass again. It's not a problem that you would have a little more grass in your seed mix um, other than fighting the competition, but just know that you're not providing for quite as many monarchs or pollinators in such a, in a concentrated area. Okay, specific seed mixes. Let's talk about the pheasants forever seed mixes so i think that those would be uh, i guess i don't know for the other states but in in iowa uh, there aren't a lot of seed dealers that just hand out seed mixes and say this is exactly what it is it's more so you call them and they're like yeah i got the cp42 approved mix and here you go and that's when you'd be great to have nrcs or something like that review it but these seed mixes are always out there through pheasants forever and uh, they come in generally at around $300 an acre. 
they're not a bad seed mix. They're a decent seed mix. I, I wouldn't be afraid to plant it. Um, but Pheasants Forever makes more of an effort to minimize cost. They're not going for the max pollinator um, benefit, which is not a problem. You just have to know what, what do you personally, as a landowner and as a person growing this, what, what do you actually care about and what do you want to do? So their seed mixes change every quarter. They're always trying to adjust to get cheaper seed mixes. And they put in native species, and generally they source most of their seed from Iowa. So it's not a bad option. And a lot of acres in Iowa are planted to Pheasants Forever mixes. Now, what I have here is the Iowa State Monarch seed mix that I helped work with our team to develop. And this one is with a little less regard to cost. So you'll come in somewhere around five to $700 an acre on this one, so twice the cost. If for you that's like, oh, that's terrifying, Seth, that's a ton of money. Um, do remember that there are lots of government programs to help cover seed costs, but then if it really freaks you out, then, then go with this one. It's going to be just fine, or, or some other kind of seed mix that's like this. But if you want um, a little bit higher pollinator value, and this one has eight times more milkweed than a standard mix such as this guy, then you'd go with something like this. Uh, I have um, a handout of this. I only have 50 copies, um, but I, we can start passing them around, and if you really want one, go ahead. But if not, um, we've got, this is on the Iowa State website, so if you just typed in ISU Monarch Seed Mix, you'd pull it up and you could print it off, and it's, it's free. So uh, this one, though, uh, will feature the, uh, this whole line here that we have going on is the, uh, the months that that all the plants flower in and the respective colors of the flowers. And then this over here is showing you what soil moisture they're adapted to. So we made this seed mix to be for a mesic soil. So it would fit a lot of different environments. And uh, we don't actually sell this seed mix. So you would just take this and basically give it to a seed dealer and say, fill this. You should also know that I'm going to be updating the seed mix in the next two months because it actually doesn't fit CP42 right now. Uh, we realized we were missing one species. We need to have one more species in the spring. So it's a great template. If you showed it to NRCS and said, I want to do this, they'd say, that's great. We need to add one species, though. Just a disclaimer on that. OK, what kind of milkweed options do we have in Iowa? We have four different kinds of milkweed that are generally available through seed dealers. We have swamp milkweed and common milkweed, which I would label as the winners. One of our uh, researchers at Iowa State, uh, Tori Postius, has shown that these will produce basically the most monarchs. And swamp is adapted to wetter soils, as you could guess. Common can grow just about anywhere. And then kind of the runners up, these guys are still really good, but uh, don't produce quite as many monarchs, would be butterfly and world milkweed. Butterfly is adapted to slightly drier soils, as is the world milkweed. And so you might say after this, well, the takeaway is that I plant swamp in common. Uh, and that's, that's, that's somewhat true, but you also need to think about what, where will it grow in the soil. So think about your soils. But then also, Tori's research shows that more milkweed species in a single site equals more monarchs overall. And so planting diversity is once again the answer. OK, let's talk about site preparation now. Before you plant a site, you have a lot of tools. You can do things basically whenever you want. You can use the herbicides you want to. There's almost no restrictions. But then as soon as you plant, your tools go away. And you have to be very careful with how you use them. And so I'd encourage you to do as much thorough site preparation beforehand as possible. We're going to go through two of the major site prep objectives. So the first one is to kill the non-native species you have there. So that's going to be generally your cool season grasses. You need to get those things completely dead. It's going to take at least two herbicide applications. And at the same time, you want to increase your percentage of bare soil so you're not just like mulching these prairie plants so they can't come through. Uh, so one way that we can do that to decrease our soil coverage is to burn the site off. And that will really help to minimize the amount of residue that we have at a site. And the easiest way to do this is to just plant soybeans. 
So go to soybeans for one to two years because it uses herbicides and it has little residue and then follow by planting soybeans. That's pretty easy to do. So that's the site preparation I would encourage you to go for if possible. That's not possible on a CRP re-enrollment, so you have to come up with ways to remove residue and spray. These are the differences you'll see in year one between a site that was brome and a site that was soybeans. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but you can see there's quite a bit of bare soil here and there's just a lower density. So this is less competitive for the prairie plants to grow in, whereas brome is a lot more mass of weeds and uh, volunteer grasses. Site prep fails. Okay, everybody likes to laugh at somebody else making some mistakes, so here we go. They're also good learning opportunities. If you just spray once in the spring, that is really not the way to go. This site was planted to native habitat, and it doesn't look like it, does it? It's about 99% brome at this site. I found a couple native grasses, but that was, that was it. So a spring glyphosate application and planting is not good enough. Okay, so then is the answer a fall application? Definitely better. Fall time, definitely better time to apply herbicides. But at this site, with one spray in September, we resulted in about 50% brome. So still not great. We have to do more to kill that brome before we transition. And then here's a site with no residue removal, and we ended up with 0% bare soil. So this was mowed a bunch of times. It was really thick ahead of time anyway. That cool season grass was really um, dense, and so we just mulched the site, and not very much came up. Let's talk about planting. So you've got options. You can use a no-till prairie drill. This is the way I like to do it. It's calibrated. You can do large areas really fast. Um, it does take some time to calibrate. And you can put the seed in different boxes to match it up right, and you get good seed soil contact. You can broadcast. There's nothing wrong with broadcasting. And basically, if you do any of these methods right, there's not a huge difference in terms of survival or long-term production of pollinator plants. You just need to make sure you calibrate this thing well and that you get good seed to soil contact. So having too much residue is not going to work well in that environment. You can also put on the jack-in-the-box kind of style uh, seed thrower. I did this just two days ago, seeded an acre. I wouldn't advise trying to do more than one to two acres because your arm will fall off. Um, it's a, you get tired and your shoulder's just carrying that weight for a long time. Um, yes, but calibration, really important on all of these. So let's talk about calibration for a second. Anybody want to guess how much seed is in this five gallon bucket? How many acres will that plant? Two. Okay, we got some good people in here. Usually people don't know these answers. This is a good crowd. Um, so somewhere around two acres of seed is probably what this would plant. And for some of you, that may be a surprise. And so we have to calibrate really well. So if you're going to broadcast this by hand, you're not going to go through a drill where you actually, you know, do some math and stuff, but you're just going to kind of throw it out there. My advice is to cut the whole seed mix in half or maybe into fourths. Go over a site a couple different times in different directions. So you make sure you spread out the seed really well. There's two things you do when you're calibrating either a seeder or a drill. You're going to adjust the planter settings themselves or mix in filler. You're actually going to do both most of the time. And that filler is going to help you spread that seed out and just bulk it up so that you don't throw it out too quickly. Planting timing. Ideally, it would be in the dormant season. So this is November 15th through March 31st, basically whenever the soil isn't frozen. Planting in the spring and the summer is more of going to favor grasses. These uh, forb seeds need to break dormancy, and so um, planting in there in the cold time is what you need to do. Frost seeding is also an option, still within that same time period, and that's good when it's muddy to do some kind of broadcasting. Good seed soil contact. Planting depth. I put a whole slide on planting depth. Zero to one-fourth of an inch. That's the deepest you can plant is a fourth of an inch. Otherwise, these things won't come up. That's the diameter of a soybean, so you have to keep these really shallow. That's slightly counterintuitive. It feels like you're scratching the soil surface, but that's how you have to do it. Okay, management. Year one, you mow the thing three to five times. When it hits knee high, mow it down to like eight inches, and that's really important. Year two, Mow once only if necessary, whack off the tops of the weeds. Year three or four, you're going to burn in the fall. If you're doing some kind of MCM through NRCS, they won't pay you until year four, so don't burn until then. 
And if you're an overachiever and you really want good habitat, you'll wait until you'll burn again in year seven, but they only pay you once in a 10-year contract to burn. So yeah, that have to be up to yourself. Mowed versus unmowed sites. Why is it so important to mow? Here on the left, you can see uh, we have a lot of weed seeds reproducing here, and we've mi minimized them here on the right. These are the differences you see at the end of year one in the plants on this no-mow site, and this is from Tallgrass Prairie, I should say that. Uh, the plants aren't doing well. What's the difference? These guys had sunlight, water, space, lack of competition. Again, another demonstration of mowing differences. On the left, we have uh, three to four species that I can identify, native species. On the right, only one, and a bunch of giant ragweed. There's a huge difference in the height here, too, so you have to mow frequently in that first year. Differences in burning. On the left, we have a site that's never been burned. Very few forbs at that site, whereas on the right, we have really high forb density. So burning as often, well, not as often as you can, but somewhere around every two to three years would be ideal if you can, but uh, don't let it go longer than five. Alternative methods and practices, which I kind of discouraged. Uh, tilling, you just don't need to do it. You need to plant into a, a firm seed bed, so it's just a waste of time and money for the most part. It increases weed seed germination. If you don't like chemicals and you don't want to kill the grasses with that, your option is tarping. I can't think of a lot of other options because tilling is not totally effective at killing. Uh, I already said this, spring-summer planting favors grasses. And then interceding into non-native grasses with no herbicides is not the way to go. Those prairie plants just really won't establish if you don't use herbicides or tarping or something to kill those species that are there. You can't just throw out seed. It won't grow. Couple things about economics, financial assistance. So there's CRP, there's Equip, there's a ton of programs. So I talked to your local conservation office or one of the private lands biologists or Pheasants Forever because I don't know all those programs and I don't have to. I'll try to answer some of them, but talk to those kind of people and they're going to be your real help in that kind of work. And like I already said, it's cheap going by about year five. I won't go through all the details, but it just makes more sense. Your break evens in about year five where it takes less time or money. So in summary, pollinator habitat provides benefits for many wildlife, not just pollinators. Everyone has a reason to establish pollinator habitat. Prepare your site well. Plant a high quality seed mix, manage your site, and most of all, connect with your local conservationist who can help walk you through this very long presentation that I just gave and help you remember and implement these things well on your land. So with that, thank you for listening. And I'll take whatever questions you guys have. So the question is, why do, we, why do I suggest burning in the fall? Burning in the fall favors forbs. Burning in the spring and some of the other times will favor the grasses. There's a lot of different ways to manage fire. It's not my area of specialty. But one thing to keep in mind is that you maintain a refuge. So only burn one half of it at any one time or one third of it is a way to manage that. The question is, what kind of filler do I use when I use a no-till prairie drill? Uh, I use mini flake, so it's just uh, animal bedding that you can get from a livestock store. I've also heard of using cocoa mulch. Things like cracked corn, I've heard, but that's too heavy. Uh, you want something that matches the approximate density and size of your native seed to help hold it in place. And so, at least I know for sawdust and cocoa mulch, that kind of keeps things from settling out and separating. Yeah, the question is about management for wild parsnip. And that is a really difficult one because it mimics the forbs that we're attempting to manage. It grows at the same time as basically uh, Golden Alexander's. So that one's a real problem one. And so the first step is to, to do really thorough site prep and make sure it's not there ahead of time and then make sure it doesn't invade from the outside. Outside of that, your management is probably going to be spot spraying it inside of, uh, of the existing prairie. So yeah, if it's your neighbors, um, talk to your neighbors, get some new ones. I, uh, I'm not sure how to answer the neighbor. So the question is, um, if you don't want to do natives, how, what other species can we use? What kind of management can we do to benefit pollinators? So in general, <coughs> excuse me, our native species are adapted to meet the needs of our native pollinators. There is definitely some crossover, 
but when you're going to plant, if you're going to do something like clover and manage for clover, you're going to provide a lot of benefit for something like honeybees, which if that's important to you, that's great. Um, and it will benefit some of the other native uh, pollinators as well. Um, so the follow-up question is, can we use, can we manage for those um, species and will they meet needs um, ma managing for those non-native species? I'm not sure if there would be a government assistance program for that. I don't think so. Um, the government's really leaning on natives at this point. So the question is uh, about when you have seed, should you mix it all together or should you use the different seed boxes on a drill? My advice would be whenever possible, use the seed boxes. Generally the middle box is the fluffy seed box, so that's if you have dirty seed that doesn't have all the holes taken off and the ons taken off. Um, so generally you don't have to use that one because people clean their seed pretty well now. Most of the dealers do. But I would say, I, I, would, I would go for using the front seed box for your forbs and your small seeds or whatever seed box it is on your specific seeder and then using. Sure. So the follow-up again is this seed company only sells seed in this bulk um, mix. And I've seen that done and it's, it's looked fine. So I, I wouldn't be scared of it. Um, my experience is only splitting the two, so that's what I know. But when you broadcast, people mix them all together. So broadcast is a little less calibrated and a little less precise, but it's not going to be a problem if they're, if they're mixed together. I just like the control and knowing I'm putting out the forbs and the grasses at the right rate. You can also have issues with those forbs are heavier generally, and they might fall down as you bounce across the ground. Um, might fall out of suspension, kind of, within that mix of sawdust and grasses. But generally, if you have enough sawdust in there, my observation has been that it doesn't really, it doesn't really fall through. So it's not a major problem. Okay, so the question is about if we're doing things more in a yard setting, so, or a garden setting, more small area, maybe three by three foot square area. Um, if you tarped that and then planted native seed there, yeah, it should work just fine. It will get, it depends where you live and how your neighbors will accept that or not accept that. And what some, uh, some cities allow you to do that. Some of them say that that's not allowed and they'll call that weeds. Um, and some of the species are going to be relatively aggressive and they may move out. If you don't have, if you're mowing your grass often, it's probably not going to matter a lot. But they they may move out over time from that that square. The question is, would it make sense to, and can you get a hundred percent forb mix? Yes, you can. I would advise you though to always include some grass to minimize erosion, and it's also going to help prevent some of your weeds, and it just promotes more structure and cover for the various, even though it's a small area cover for pollinators and things like that. It's just a more complete system. Forbs don't do a lot of ground coverage, and so you still need some ground coverage, and the grasses will help provide that. The question then is, how do we manage a site that's small like that? I would basically say do the same thing, but since it's so small, I'd mow it more often because that's beneficial. You could also do a little bit of hand weeding. This is if you wanted to do kind of what I'm talking about. Now, if you want to manage this more in kind of a, a landscape um, kind of management style, there's a program through the University of Kansas where they do something called Monarch Way Stations, where you basically have certain nectar species and certain milkweed species that you plant in more of a managed kind of landscaped look kind of approach. That's the more common approach when you're doing something small is you grow them from plugs or from rootstock, not from seed. The question is, what do we do for seed sources to make sure we don't have palm or amaranth in the seed? So a major way to help avoid that is buying seed that's from uh, your state. And if you're in Kansas, <laughs> that's a little rough. Uh, some of your states that have more palmer, so buying from a state that doesn't have a palmer problem talk to the seed dealer about it, ask them a lot of questions about it. At the same time, at least in Iowa, I don't know all the other states, it's a noxious weed, so it would have to be identified in a seed mix. 
So it's a lot less of a concern than it used to be. I've got so the question is, if we were going to plant, basically starting from now, we would burn the site off. Um, and then he's asking, would I spray after that and then plant into May? And my advice is going to be, that's your first application of herbicide. I, I, would, I would avoid that. You're probably going to see similar response to what I showed with that 99% brome stand. It's, it's not going to look pretty with only one spray. The grass just does not die well in the spring, if we're talking about a grass setup. The, the burning, yes, if you burn in the spring, it will help, but that doesn't really do anything other than just reduce the density of your grass. Uh, brome, <laughs> brome sometimes comes back pretty angry after a burn because you've opened up the soil profile. So the question is clarifying, am I saying just go ahead and plant it? I am saying, if possible, I like your plan of burn, spray, but then I would spray two more times and plant in the fall. I know that that's a long time that's stretched out, but I would just wait. And I and know that I'm asking for a lot of patience from you guys and, and these plantings, but what I'm afraid of is you do something really fast, you throw it out there, and then two, three years down the road, you're really disappointed, and you're like, I hate native habitat. So I want you to spend that time, that extra six months or whatever, so that it looks awesome instead of looks like garbage and you don't want to do native plantings again.